Okay, so uh, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. As Jason has been saying, today we're going to definitely start the last topic. Um, hopefully we can get to finish it up as well. We are going to finish, start, and hopefully finish partial derivatives. Before that, we had some stuff to clean up from last class, though. Um, we have to talk about continuity. So last time we started talking about limits. Let's jump back into that. Um, boom, boom, boom. There we go. And let's continue. So this was on the 14th. We were missing Jason's energy and presence that day, but he's back today, so we're all good. Um, so limits, uh, we have some technical definitions here, but we pretty much went for the intuitive field. Um, we looked at a process to show how when limits do not exist, basically you just want to approach a limit along two different paths and show that you get different answers. Um, we also saw that we can show that limits do exist via things like the squeeze theorem, via things like simplifying and plugging in, via things like plugging in directly, all that good stuff. So we pretty much spent a lot of yet, uh, yesterday's class just learning how to compute limits, when you would do what, which approach. And um, yeah, it was all fun, it was all good. And we got to do a lot of examples, obviously. And we're now, boom, here. So um, once we got through limits, how to compute them, how to show they don't exist, how to show they do exist, when to try to show which. Um, we got to continuity. Now you might, may recall uh, doing continuity in Calc 1, and you may also recall that in Calc 1, continuity was defined in terms of limits. So, uh, we used the squeeze theorem um, in the last class. So right now we're talking about a, a whole different topic. Okay, so continuity, again, just ba like back in Calc 1, it has the intuition that you think it has. So to say that a function is continuous at a point means that there's no gap, there's no hole, there's no break, there's no disruption. And we saw in Calculus 1 that that basically means that the value of the function at a point is actually equal to the value of the limit of the function at that point. And in calculus three and in higher dimensions, this exact same definition would still hold true. So if we're looking at a two variable function, for example, and we want to know, is it continuous at the point A comma B, then all we need to do is check this equation. Is the limit as we approach AB equal to the value of the function at AB? And if it is, we say that it's continuous at that point AB. If this works for all points in the domain of the function, we say the function is continuous in general. So that those are no new definitions, pretty much exactly the same definition that you had in Calc 1, except now we have a multivariable limit. We're talking about a multivariable function. And yeah, so now everything that you know about continuity and limits and all that good stuff from Calc 1, those things are still true. Um, so things like Knowing how to check for continuity amounts to checking three steps. The function must be defined at the point, the limit must exist at the point, and both must be equal that you would have gone through in Calc 1, as well as a lot of the other things are still going to be true. So uh, the extreme value theorem still holds in higher dimensions. Limits still distribute across sums, differences, products, et cetera. Uh, you can factor constants outside of, of limits. Limits can pass through continuous functions. Um, let me write down an example of what that means. So, so for example, if I want to find the limit of say x approaches a of the sine of some function f of x, I can move the limit inside the sine function and take the limit of the angle. Or if I wanted to find the limit as x approaches a of e to the f of x, then I can move the limit inside of the exponential, et cetera, right? So all those things that you know from uh, limits, all those intuitive notions that you have, they're still actually true, uh, as well as that applies to continuous functions. Um, composition of continuous functions are continuous. If you multiply two continuous functions, you get a continuous function. If you subtract or add continuous functions, you get a continuous function. If you divide two continuous functions, you get the result is continuous as long as you're not divided by zero. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Lots of things that you guys are very familiar with that I'm just not going to beat anymore with a dead horse. So we're going to pretty much just jump into some examples here. So we're gonna do some examples. And uh, today, and this is why today's lecture might spill in, into tomorrow's lecture a little bit, uh, is because I, I wanna actually show you some visualizations as well, because that's always nice. Um, so we're going to look at the following functions and we're going to determine where they are continuous. And again, we're gonna jump in here because a lot of it is very intuitive. So we are just going to get started. We have uh, six examples here to get through. So let's actually do that. And I'm going to do visualizations for about three of them. So there are a bunch of online calculators that you can use to plot three-dimensional graphs. And here are two of them that I'll be using. Um, probably most, mostly the first one, because I think when it comes to still pictures, this one would look nicer. But when it comes to like a, a moving picture, that one is nicer. So we'll actually look at these. Um, so let's actually jump in and, and talk about this. Um, here's a given function, A. Tell me where, where it is continuous. So go, take it away. Someone tell me where this is continuous. Right, if x not equals y, so it's a fraction. So for continuity, uh, we need x minus y to not be 0. So this means x cannot be y. And um, other than that, the numerator and denominator are polynomials. So individually, the numerator and denominator don't have any other problems themselves. And so, yeah, pretty much you can basically say it's continuous on the set of all coordinates such that Except x is that not equal to zero. Right, which means that x is not equal to y. And of course, you should have the intuition, remember, x equals y is a plane. So I don't want you to think that this is just on a line. It's literally the entire plane, x equals y. You cannot touch that part of this function, okay? Now, as long as you're not at that point, you can use difference of scores to simplify this guy. This guy is going to behave just like um, x plus y would behave, except when you're on the plane, x equals y, it will not work. It will just uh, have like a gap. So the, 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 the plane x equals y is like a huge gap running through this function. It's not going to work. Other than that, it behaves like the plane z equals x plus y. So yeah, that example wasn't so bad. Now I'm going to sketch it. What about this guy? So you might have recalled this guy. This was the guy whose limit actually existed, but we didn't know that in the beginning. And we just kind of started to go through a bunch of paths and we kept getting zero. And then, you know, Abdul Rahman was fooling us the whole time. It actually existed, but he never told us. And then he just started laughing at us at the end of the day. Okay, so that, that's this guy. Where is this guy continuing? So for continuity, what do we need here? Right, x squared plus y squared cannot equal zero. Um, what does that mean? Uh, can you tell me, is that along the plane? Uh, like where, where would that be the case? Think about the x y like coordinate, like you know, think about it like in you know, the x y coordinate, the x the x axis and the y axis. You can have anything as long as x squared plus y squared does not equal to zero. So basically, it can be infinite, many things, many points, except as long as it does it does not equal to zero. That's all that matters. Okay, tell me where it would equal to zero. Where would it equal to zero? Yeah. Uh, hmm. 
if the x equals to zero or y equals to zero, but however, as long as x squared plus y squared in the denominator does not equal to zero, that's all that matters. Unless it's like, it, that's all that matters. Only if the one of the variables, if x is zero or if y equals five, or if x equals five or y equals zero, therefore it would yeah, be zero. Yeah, you need zero. to uh, like simplify. Like tell me specifically where. Where would it be the case? Where would x squared plus y squared be equal to zero? Notice it's literally one spot in the entirety of three space, right? You literally cannot be zero at the same time. One or the other can be zero, except once one of them is zero, the other guy can't be zero. Literally the only time the sum of squares is going to be zero is when both squares are zero. So literally the only thing that we're not allowed to touch in this function is the origin. So this is continuous on, well, R3, except at the origin. Or you can say something like it's continuous on, i.e. continuous on the set. I don't know what's with me and my set brackets today. Set x comma y uh, such that x comma y is not the origin specifically. There's literally only one spot actually where this is going to be a problem. Which means other than that, that one spot, this thing actually looks uh, pretty nice. Um, okay, what if I gave you this function? Which notice that it starts out looking like the same function. Where is that continuous? So this one is a little bit more detailed. Would it be negative infinity over infinity? Uh, as in negative infinity over infinity? Is that what you just said? I mean, common infinity, sorry. Okay, so negative infinity, common infinity is an interval. Is that what you want to say? It's continuous on some interval? Yes. And which interval are you talking? Where's that negative infinity to infinity going? On the x-axis, on the y-axis? Okay, so this one isn't as clear cut as the others because it's a piecewise function. So for problems like this is where you really need the definition. This is what you need to check, okay? So to go over this, um, looking at this function, we have to just uh, examine all the pieces. So on one hand, it's this guy. Now we already know that that guy doesn't work at the origin, but we're told that we're not at the origin when we're taking that definition. If you look in the first line, it's that guy if we're not at the origin. So actually this guy is actually fine. Right, so at this point, you can notice here, uh, if we're not at zero, zero, we're fine. So now let's check at zero, zero. How would we know whether or not we're continuous at the origin? What would we have to check? Well, we'd have to check the definition. We'd have to check does the limit as x, y approach zero comma zero of our function 
equals f of zero comma zero. We need to check if that is the case. Now this we actually found yesterday was zero. All right, so this found last class. Now, if I didn't find it for you, of course, you'd have to actually compute this limit, which as of last class, hopefully you guys are all experts at that. And this guy here is actually equal to zero by definition of the function. If I look here, I, I'm given that if x comma y is zero comma zero, it will be zero. So this here is zero by definition of the function. And so this would mean f is continuous at 0, 0. Now, since I know if I'm not at 0, 0, everything is OK because I'm not divided by 0. I have a ratio of continuous functions, and each of them individually behave, and I'm not divided by 0. So everything is fine as long as we're not at the origin. Then I go and I check the origin specifically because this is only the potential bad point. Um, but the limit checks out. And so here we can finally conclude F is continuous everywhere. And someone did mention this in the comments, but I want to know, I want you guys to know where that reason actually came from. Um, or you can say something like F is continuous on all of R3 or something like that. Isn't it except the origin? No, it's also yeah. continuous at the origin. And how come, like, that's, you what, know, that's, literally, that's literally what I just proved. I checked at the origin and the definition of continuity works. The limit as I approach the origin is equal to the value of the function at the origin. Yeah, at that part, but whenever it comes, when it came to x squared times y over x squared plus y squared, it didn't really work. Well, that's because we didn't have this second line, right? We put in a, we put in a piecewise function. There's like a, a second line here, right? Where we're equal to zero. There was, this line was added, right? So the function is not the same as the last one. This one is just giving us this part. Here, the function added, we added a piece to it. We said, it's this definition is for not at the origin and it's zero if we are at the origin. So this is some new information that we're given. Basically, this is like when someone um, comes in and they see that a line has a hole in it and then they fill in the hole. So now it wasn't continuous before, but they made it continuous by adding some more information. Uh, what brackets notation? Uh, you mean so something like uh, in bracket notation, you would say f is continuous on the set of all x comma y such that um, x comma y is in R three, R R two. Um, so that's another way to say it. Uh, another way to say it, f is continuous on x comma y uh, such that x and y are real numbers. Another way to say it. One thing you want to know that it's not correct to say, not correct, is to say f is continuous for like negative infinity to infinity. That's not correct because that guy is an interval. It's not a two dimensional space. Now, uh, I wanna actually show you guys what this guy actually looks like. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're gonna head over um, to My browser. So there is the uh, the 
Zoom chat, that's where the magic happens. Okay, so here is a plotter, 3D plotter. Uh, the link is already in the, in the notes. So this guy is our Pringles potato chip. This is the hyperbolic paraboloid. You notice here is the equation, um, x squared minus y squared, looks like this guy, right? So now uh, let's look at what the guy we were just looking at looks like. So this would be x squared times y divided by x squared plus y squared. So that's the guy that we look like. Now he looks pretty nice. In fact, here, there, you can see a little kink. The origin is, is like right here where my arrow is. There's a little kink, um, but you can't really see the problem uh, from this. But essentially, there is an issue in the middle right here, but we filled in the issue. But literally, it's only one point that's missing, so it's not going to show up very well on this graph. But that's what the guy actually looks like, which is uh, very nice, as you can see. Um, another one. Here's another one. And this is the, the function that you're looking at right here is 7xy divided by e raised to the x squared plus y squared. It looks like this. See, this one can rotate. So you can look at all these guys that we were looking at earlier. And if I put back our original function that we're looking at x squared times y divided by x squared plus y squared, there he goes. That's what a guy looks like. And at the origin, like I said, it's right there in the middle, that little kink. Um, you're not going to, like literally, it's literally one point that's missing. You're not going to be able to see it from this graph. Later on, I'm going to show you some guys where you're definitely going to be able to see visually. Yep, this function definitely has a problem right there. No, no ambiguity. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is uh, our guy right here from um, the example that we're just doing. So let me, uh, right, so that's what it was looking like. And if you guys want to look at uh, any of the these functions that we're looking at yesterday or, or, or anything, um, you can go to that website and you can see it. So this is what that guy looks like. So here's the here's the graph. Um, so was this continuous here? Boop. But we fixed it. So this is an example to use Calc one language of a removable discontinuity. Um, but that's that's actually what we're looking at. So it's nice. All right, let's uh, look at another example. Now here, because I, I just wanted to give you an, another example where you would see that in again it's the same guy essentially, but I modified the other part. Now down here is one. So let's pretend that this was the problem. You would actually approach it very similar. First, you will notice that if we're not at the origin, or let's phrase it a different way. So if our x, y is not 0, 0, we're fine. So check 0, 0. Now, what you would do to check zero, zero is you would check, is the limit as x comma y approaches zero comma zero of the function equal to the value of the function at the point, right? Now, we don't know if this is the case, so I put a question mark here. Now, this one, again, we know is zero from the previous class. This is one from the definition. this from previous class. So now you'd realize that they're actually not equal. 
So at this point, you can conclude F is not continuous at the origin, meaning now F is continuous on what the original guy was continuous on, the very original before anything. Um, the set of all X comma Y such that X, Y is not zero comma zero. So at this point, it's like uh, we had the guy. Uh, at this point, it's like we have this guy, but we filled in uh, the wrong point. So it's like we have this, but we literally filled in some point hovering one unit above where it needs to be. We filled in this point, but the problem was down here. So now it remains discontinuous at the origin. Okay, so some visual aids there. Look here, this function. Here's another function. And again, remember composition of continuous functions are continuous functions, divisions of continuous functions are continuous functions. So obviously here, the issue is division by y uh, for continuity. y cannot be zero, i.e. we cannot be on the plane. Because you, you've spent years of your life being ingrained that y equals zero is a line. So I, every opportunity I get, I have to remind you that y equals zero is actually a plane. So literally on the entire XZ plane, this function cannot exist. It's, it's, it has disruptions along that entire plane. Um, so F is continuous. At X equals zero and Y does not equal zero. On X comma Y such that um, just Y not equal to zero. Now, um, if we go back, To this guy, um, let's type that guy in. It was the sine of x divided by y. Yes. Now look at that. Notice what where all this thing is going. Notice where all this disruption in the middle is. Here's the y axis here. Here's where y equals zero right here. Literally going through there, through that path is no bueno, right? The farther we get from zero, the nicer this thing starts to look. But look at what happens when we are, are lining up with, this is literally the, the, the y equals zero line right here is where the disruptions are happening. So that's our picture. You see that the function starts getting crazy once you start getting close to division by zero. And then it's a sine function, so it starts oscillating like crazy, but then it can't actually settle at a value. So that's, that's the guy right here. It's, a, it's a, a very, very crazy looking function. Um, and I mean, I need a couple of views of this one. I'm pacing it in the one note right now. Lt. 
take another view from above. Screenshot. It's like chicken. Okay, now turn. Yeah, you love the camera. You love the camera. Turn her. Okay. A bunch of snapshots here. Um, and if you want to see the the guy in a, in another thing, like sine of x divided by y here, um, there is the guy. And now you can see it's uh, like you can just set it to rotate at a certain speed, and you can just see like all along the x x z plane like it's just it's craziness it's chaos division by zero is really it's really killing us out there yeah so that one's really trippy and functions can get really trippy so here you'll notice that this line here is little this is like the plane where y equals zero going through there, right? So the plane y equals zero is passing through here. The plane y equals zero is passing through here. And yeah, craziness happens. Like, yeah. it's not a joke that that one's not continuous. In fact, that's not removable. Clearly you can see, you can't fix that guy by fixing a single point. Um, You'd literally have to re rethink the entire function to change that. Here's another example. So this one, again, uh, for notice, of course, if we're not at the origin, we're fine. So now I go and I check at zero comma zero. So now I want to check, does the limit as I approach the origin f of x equals the value of the function at the origin? Now the value of the function that is given, we're told it's zero. What is this limit? What is the limit as x, y approaches zero of this guy? Are you sure it's zero? I mean, answer quickly, but not too quickly. Oh, so now you're just guessing one? Or is that what we're doing? We're throwing out random numbers now? <laughs> How did you get one? How did you get zero? Minus pi. I vote for minus pi. E to the pi, maybe. Remember your training grasshoppers. Examine that limit. Tell me what the answer is. Anyone? A half? How are we getting a half now? Is it a half? Is a half your answer?
<laughs> None of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that would have been on the test. None of the above. I select choice F. This isn't a trick. In fact, we actually did this problem before. So it's, it's literally not a trick. You've literally seen it before. It was one of the examples we did yesterday. Well, don't look at what we did yesterday. You're, you're supposed to be looking at that right now, take it at its face value, and then uh, evaluate it. Don't look back at what we did yesterday. Try to figure it out. You're supposed to question everything. Of course, don't go overboard with it. Jason, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, what I would say is that as long as we're not in the origin, we're fine. If that's what you think. If no, I mean this. The question is, what is the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 of this thing? 0, 0? I mean, like, you know, it would just be infinity. Like, you know, infinity over infinity. That will be an indeterminate form. That's what I would, I could well, determine. Well, it would go to 0 over 0, but no, that's not how you examine limits. 0 over 0 is indeterminate. You can't say anything from 0 over 0. Yeah, like I said, it's an indeterminate. That's what I said just now. I mean, like, however, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't work if for the origin, zero, zero, for this part, the first half. Why? Because it's like indeterminate form, like, you know. Indeterminate doesn't mean the limit doesn't exist. Right, we did examples yesterday where we saw an indeterminate form and the limit did exist. Indeterminate means you can't tell what it is at face value. You have to do something. Uh... Okay, so remember your training grasshoppers. You see a limit that you don't know how to deal with. What do you do? Step one, try to show it does not exist, which means you should immediately start thinking, what happens if I approach this from different paths? What paths? One path is going to be the obvious path. Let's approach along x equals zero. I get the answer zero. Okay, let's, what's another obvious path? Well, something that allows me to combine the terms in the denominator, y equals x. You'll notice that if you approach from y equals x, you'll get the answer a half. A half is not equal to zero, therefore, does not exist, right? That's what should go through your head. That's how you're supposed to think about a problem. You know, what did, happen? What did Javon do in his notes? What, what did happen? What's going on? Like, no, you have to remember the strategy and you just know when I'm in this situation, when I'm faced with this problem, this is how I get myself out of it. This is what I look for first. This is what I look for second. This is what I look for third. Okay. So this actually does not exist, which means it's not continuous at the origin. Which means F is continuous well, ever except the origin. So here it's like you have to use what you learned about limits, but at the same time, you need to match that up to sub the output of the function at some point of interest. And then you have to see, does the limit and the point of interest agree? If they agree, then it's continuous at that point. If they don't agree, it's not continuous at that point. But ultimately, you need to know how to find limits. We, we covered that uh, a lot yesterday. Um, let's look at... Uh, what does um, this guy look like? So last time we looked at x squared y divided by x squared plus y squared. That guy only had a problem at one point. 
Now we're looking at x times y over x squared plus y squared. Uh, did I type something wrong? The spaces. Oh, you think it doesn't like the spaces? I put spaces last time. Maybe it doesn't like the multiplication. Maybe I need to put an asterisk. Oh, that's what it didn't like. So here, notice what happens when before, you can compare this to what we saw when it was an x squared y versus an x times y in the numerator. Notice with an x times y, there's like this huge little chasm right here in our function. Right, that wasn't there before. So here, x times y less than over x squared plus y squared. So that's what our guy looks like. It's not as bad as the one we had just before, but compared to your x squared y, yeah, look at that guy. That, that's what's going on at the origin. Now you guys can just watch. Uh, let me take some pictures of this. So now we're just looking at this guy from different views. Go back and we're back. So these are just some different views. Um, the sky, was that guy? I see some pictures and, and you guys have the websites. I, I, I sent links to both of these websites up, uh, up here. Where I'm taking the snapshots from is the first link. But the one that you can like just have things rotating, um, it's the second link. That was example F. I believe that was the last example in this section. All right. Uh, okay. And that's pretty much all I wanted to cover over there. So you should know how to find where a function is continuous. Here, um, I kind of put these, this little blurb here for the sake of completeness. Uh, technically, I don't think you'll ever need to actually know this stuff. But just to mention, what we were doing here can work in higher dimensions as well. It just gets a lot harder the moment you start bumping up for dimensions. Um, so for higher than three dimensions, once you're in 4D or higher, it becomes much more efficient to use vectors to describe everything. So you'd, you'd describe a point, a variable point as just a coordinate of variables. You'll describe a constant point that you're approaching as a coordinate of constants. And you can actually use vectors to talk about this stuff. And the squeeze theorem would apply in, in the cases of vectors as well. Of course, you have to be 
when you take the absolute value in this case, of course, that means you're taking the absolute value of a vector. And so you have to use the, um, the formulas for the magnitude of a vector and et cetera. But when you get high enough dimensions, it becomes much more important to think of things in terms of vectors. So that's basically what I'm just saying. A precise definition for what it means to be continuous in Rn, nth dimensional Euclidean space, is essentially this. Now, the definition looks almost exactly the same as it did back in Calc 1. However, you want to be aware that the x here is a vector with n components, and your a is also a vector with n components. Um, so yeah. All right. So hopefully that was interesting. Uh, so now you can actually see, uh, put a face to the name. Um, and this was the guy that actually existed that gave us trouble yesterday, but uh, now. Uh, now we see him. We're not scared. We know what he looks like. We have tons of ways of looking at him now and defeating this problem. So, all right, we're good. Moving on to partial derivatives, finally. Okay. So, now, there is such a thing as a derivative in general in higher dimensions. However, this is going to require you know a lot about matrix uh, linear algebra. Um, the derivative is a beast that looks like a matrix where each component is, has what you have call a partial derivative. And it turns out partial derivative is what we're going to talk about right now. Okay, so a partial derivative isn't going to be the full picture of a derivative. However, it is very important in computing the full picture of a derivative. And it also has a lot of valuable applications otherwise. And we can also talk about differentiability when would you be able to differentiate a multivariable function in terms of partial derivatives? The partial derivatives is all around very nice, very useful, but just so you know, it's a partial derivative. It's not the derivative in the full generality, in the full picture, in all its glory. And unfortunately, most of you, unless you're, not a, unless you're a math major, you'll never actually see the derivative in its full glory. As a math major, you're gonna d encounter that guy in I want to say advanced calculus two is the first place where you're going to actually know what a derivative is. In the same way that you thought for years y equals x um, was a line, but you realize that there is something bigger than that. That's just a shadow of what it is. In the same way, you will eventually learn that the derivative as you learned in calc one, um, limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h is really a shadow of what the derivative really is. The beast that is the derivative in its full generality is something much, much more grandiose than that. Uh, unfortunately, most people in the population will never be able to see this. Um, but if you're a math major, you're in luck. You will be able to see it in a couple of years. Um, three, two or three semesters. Okay. So for now, what we're going to look at, though, is the partial derivative. And this is really what you can think of it as is the derivative from a, a certain perspective the derivative from the perspective of one variable at a time. So essentially what this is going to be for a multivariable function, you can talk about things like, say you have a function of x and y, you can talk about things like the partial derivative with respect to x or the partial derivative with respect to y, et cetera. And basically what this means is that you're looking at this multivariable function where it has variables x and y as independent variables. However, what you do is you look at x as a variable and you pretend all other variables are constants. They might as well be constants. They're, you freeze everyone except one guy, and then you look at the derivative in terms of that guy, right? And this is what you call a partial derivative. Now, to indicate that you're looking at a partial derivative, you actually change the notation. So we're upgrading our notation here, right? So, you know, we're moving out the hood, we're getting a nicer car, everything like that. When you want to talk about a partial derivative, you draw a curly D, right? So, no, so when someone writes something like uh, D dx of f, this we think of as an ordinary derivative. Here, we are thinking of things like, this is like the calc one version. And here you would assume that f is a single variable function. However, you can get bigger. You can go something like this and you draw like a curly D like that. 
This is what's called a partial derivative, meaning um, it's a derivative with respect to the x variable, but with the awareness there are other variables out there. Um, so the partial derivative with respect to x, but f is a multivariable function. So there are other variables out there. Right? So you draw a very curly D. Yes, it looks like a backward six. And it turns out that some students write their Ds like this anyway. And so there were tons of students where in Calc 1, I had to correct them when they were writing derivative. They would write their Ds like, like that or something like in, instead of like this. And I had to correct them like, no, write it like this. And I'd, I'd write over it and go, no, you should be writing this instead. And they're like, oh, Javon, he's just, he's just uh, trying to take off points for no reason. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. There's going to come a point where things are going to change. Like I was telling you guys, language is important. How you write things down is important because there comes a point where if you're not doing everything correctly, there comes a point where when the notation changes on you, you're not going to notice and you're going to read something and you're going to have a completely different picture in your head than what's actually going on. And then you're going to be there studying for hours a day and still getting bad grades because you're all confused. And a part of it is just language. Part of it is just you never were writing things down correctly in the first place. So it wasn't that I, I sometimes I, I mark people take off points for things and they think I'm being mean, but it's not that I'm being mean. I just know where you're going and I understand this thing that you don't think is a big deal right now is a bad habit that you're going to pay for later. So correct it now. Um, so the notation is the following. So we do have a Leibniz version of the notation here, but we use curly D. So this is still called the Leibniz notation. And there's another notation that we have, this guy, where we do a subscript. This is called the subscript notation. Um, there is no prime notation anymore. So to say f prime of x, not a thing anymore. Right? Because if someone says f prime of x comma y is too vague, right? The prime indicates you're taking a derivative, but it's too vague. The prime notation indicates you're taking a derivative, uh, but you're not sure with respect to who. Is x the variable? Ugh. With respect to who? You don't know if you're taking the derivative with respect to x or with respect to y. So the prime is very vague. It's not used anymore. Once you go into a higher dimensional uh, kind of situation, you either use the Leibniz notation or the subscript notation. And they actually behave differently. Depend they mean the same thing, but you have to be careful. I'll talk about that later in how these notations behave. There are some other very common notations, but we're not going to be using them. I'm going to use either the Leibniz or the subscript notation. And most of the time, I'll write down the subscript notation because it's actually just easier to write down. It's easier to write just an f sub x instead of a squiggly df divided by squiggly dx. Um, there are times where the Leibniz notation is actually quite useful. Um, but um, at this level, whichever notation you want to use is fine. Just don't mix the notations. Now, what is the technical definition of a partial derivative? It's like this guy here. Um, it looks very much like a difference quotient. However, you'll notice for the partial derivative with respect to x, the h, the x plus h, the x is what's changing by h, whereas the y is being left alone. In the partial derivative with respect to y, the y is changing by the h, and the x is being left alone. So this is called a partial derivative. Visually, what does this mean? It means I have this surface, and I just, I look in the x direction for the derivative and I'm looking at the slope just in the x direction. It's very different from the slope in the y direction, right? If you want a, another visualization, here's like a surface. Let me actually uh, reduce the size a little bit. Here's like a surface. When I take a partial derivative, it's like I'm slicing through a surface with a plane. So this here is some plane 
let's say this here is y equals a constant, it will slice through this curve like here, right? Then I can find a tangent line to that, right? Which brings you over here. Now the slope of this tangent line is the partial with respect to x at the point or points where y equals k. So if I slice through with a, a constant, so I'm thinking of my y as a constant, which means I'm thinking of it as a plane in three space. When it slices through my function, if I imagine the, cur the cross section as the curve I'm measuring, and I find a tangent line to that curve, the slope of that tangent line is a partial with respect to x. If here, if I have x equals a constant, then the slope here equals the partial with respect to y, et cetera, right? Now, again, here's another visualization. This one is that these are actually from your textbook, so you can read those slowly. Um, but that's the visual, the visuals of what's going on, okay? Um, so yeah, you're like taking the slope of a tangent line, but from a very specific perspective. And you can change the constant k, and you will just move this plane forward or backwards through the surface. You'll get new curves to which you can find new tangent lines to which you can find new slopes. So the slope is a much more dynamic animal now, right? And slicing one direction versus slicing the other direction, I can get different slopes. So uh, yeah, we can now find the derivative in the x direction versus the y direction. Let's make this a little bigger. All right, so that's visually what a, a, a partial derivative is. Now let's talk about computationally, uh, what everyone loves, right? Um, if I ask you to compute a partial derivative, how would you do it? Now I'm not even gonna ask you to use the definition of the derivative. We're not even gonna touch that, right? So forget about that, you will never have to worry about that. Um, the definition is important. Technically, you should know it, and you should definitely know it because if a, a, a multiple choice problem asks you about it, you should know how to answer that problem. However, computationally speaking, we're just going to do the shortcut way. Um, and at this point, you guys do know enough to do the shortcut way. Here's the thing about computationally finding a partial derivative. It's pretty much exactly the same as you did find derivatives in Calc 1. The only difference is here is that you hold one variable, old hold all variables constant except the one you're focused on at a time. And uh, so here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna just jump in and I'm gonna show you what that would actually look like for, for these guys here. So let's move these guys over. So here's a function, f of xy equals three x squared So here's my function, f of xy equals 3x squared minus 2x cubed y plus 3xy cubed minus 2y to the fourth. All right. <laughs> Jason's all excited now, <laughs> like, yes, we're doing it. Is everyone ready? Okay. They're going to, they're, they're, I, I don't think they're all ready yet, Jason, but I'll get them ready. Don't worry. Okay. So find all partial derivatives of f's. Now, as far as you're concerned, you have one partial derivative for each variable that's present. So if I have a two variable function, there are two important partial derivatives. If I have a function of X and Y, then <laughs> the suspense, I'm like really just blabbering on before showing you. If I have a function X and Y, you should think of there being two partial derivatives. So you'll have one for each variable. So f here has two. There is the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. Now let's, uh, let's get this bread, right? What would it mean to take the partial with respect to x? Here is what it means. It means pretend all variables.
are constants except x. Then you are going to actually take the derivative with respect to x. So you're going to go to this function, 3x squared, blah, 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 and you're going to literally take the derivative by pretending your y variable is a number. It's, it might as well be 5 or 2 or something else. So how would I take the derivative? Well, the derivative of 3x squared would be 6x minus the derivative. What is the derivative of 2x cubed y? Well, it would be 6x squared y. Right? Then that's because I'm just keeping my y as a constant, so I leave it alone. When I have a constant times a, a function, y the cubed. derivative is going to just be the derivative of the function times the constant. So here, I just took the derivative of the x squared, and I left everyone else alone. In fact, let me actually just write it out another way. What I do is I leave the 2y alone because it's constant, and I'm going to differentiate the x cubed. So I would get 3x squared. And I continue in this fashion. So when I get to the 3xy cubed, I would leave the 3y cubed, and I'm going to differentiate the x which is just one. When I get to the minus two y to the fourth, this is just zero. Notice that this guy is constant because my minus two y to the fourth is a constant with respect to x. So the derivative of two y fourth, so derivative with respect to x of minus two y to the fourth is zero. And so now, of course, when you'll get quicker with this in your head after you do it a few times, I can clean up. This is six x minus six x squared y plus three y cubed. That is going to be my partial with respect to x. Are we getting it? Uh, I just have one quick question. Yes. So in so for this example, let's say you're, so basically whenever we're doing partial derivatives, if we have uh, a variable that's a constant and it's by itself, meaning that it's not also being, meaning that the variable that's also being derived isn't, I guess, attached to it, it would just automatically be zero. Yes, because the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay. Okay, got it. Right? It, it's literally like it's literally like the y could be a five for all we care. Does anyone want to do FY, the derivative Jason, of Jason, hold on, hold on. I know you're excited, but Stay with the class for all we care. What this means is that if I look at this function, I know you already looked at this, but not everyone looked at it, Jason. So I want to make sure that we're not running too fast for everybody. So if I looked at this function here, right, I could literally just think of the y's as fives or twos or whatever your favorite number is. So if I think of this, as three x squared minus two times x cubed times five plus three x times five cubed minus two times five to the fourth, and I want to take a derivative, how would I have done it? Well, that would be six x. Here would be six x squared times five. Here I would have three times five cubed, and this would be zero, right? Because that's a constant, right? So you can literally just envision there's just some number in place of y. And everything you would have done in that situation, you are going to do here. So if there's no x attached to it, then it is a constant as far as you care if you're taking the partial with respect to y, if it's partial with respect to x. And so, yeah, if it's by itself, there's no x attached to it, the derivative is going to go to zero when I'm finding f sub x. So, um, Here's the function again. 
What about partial with respect to y? You want to try it, Kayla? Uh, yeah, I'll go. So okay. the first part, 3x squared would be 0, since x is a constant. Mm -hmm. And then you would have minus 2x cubed, because when you, der when you derive y, that would be 1. Mm -hmm. And then the next part would be plus 9x times y squared. Mm -hmm. And then the last part is minus eight times y cubed. Correct. Okay. That's what I got in the first place. So pump right. up is, is there anyone it. who's is there anyone who's not getting it? Or do we think we 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 know what's going on now? So it's when you want to find the partial derivative with respect to some variable, you pretend every other variable other than that one you're, you're looking at is a constant. Now, there are going to be times where we're going to have even more than two variables in place. So it's very important that you get this concept down. Every other variable, except the one that you're taking the derivative with respect to, is a constant in your mind's eye. It's, you treat it the same way you would treat a number. It doesn't matter if there were 10 other variables here. Everybody except y is a constant. And then you differentiate all the functions of y and you treat everybody else as if they were numbers, right? This is called a partial derivative. So these are the two partial derivatives of this function. Now, of course, once you find a partial derivative, you can treat them just as other functions. So for example, if I went here and now I ask you, well, Evaluate the partial derivative with respect to x at the point minus 1, comma 0. Um, make that a little bigger. So here we saw that the partial with respect to x was equal to um, 6x minus 6x squared y. plus 3y cubed. So this means that if I take partial with respect to x and I evaluate it at the point 1, comma 0, it literally means that I went to this plane. I looked at the plane y equals 0, and then I picked the particular point on that plane where my x was negative 1. Right, so I, I slice through with the plane y equals zero. I go where x equals negative one. I find that coordinate on that curve of intersection, and then I evaluate the slope at, at that point. So I'm literally going to plug in negative one for x, and zeros for the y's. And so that's negative six, as Jason said in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Had an idea. Yeah. That, 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 like if if I didn't say it, Jason would be like, eh, well, that's what I said. <laughs> like, which I'm not disputing. <laughs> okay. Um anyone ready for this one? I am. Um, all right, so here, uh boom. We saw, I mean, this concept I think is much less confusing than the last concept. So I'm not even gonna, I'm just gonna do it. We have, we have a lot more interesting stuff to get to. So let's actually just move on with our lives. Okay, so we saw, we saw partial with respect to y was equal to this guy. So that means I think of uh, my x as the plane x equals 1 slicing through. I would get a curve inter of intersection between the surface of whatever this graph looks like. It's, it, it's going to look crazy, I can tell you that. You can plot this later on in the, in the website that I gave you. Um, 
it, you can plot this in the, the website that I gave you, see what it looks like. But then slice through that guy with a plane x equals one, then find the coordinate where y equals one, measure the tangent line there. What is the slope? That's what this question is asking. So this would mean that my partial with respect to y at one comma one is just, literally just go in, plug in one for, uh, for x, and, x and, and y. So that's gonna be minus two plus nine minus eight. So you get negative one. All right. So hopefully that was clear. I mean, finding the, the partial derivative is the, is the quote unquote harder part. Plugging in the numbers should be relatively easy. Whatever is in the X coordinate, plug it in for all the X values. Whatever is in the, the Y coordinate, plug it in all the Y positions, et cetera. All right. Now, I do want you to be aware. Let's make this a little bit harder, a little bit more general. All your old derivative rules, they apply. Product rule, still a thing. Chain rule, still a thing. Quotient rule, still a thing. All of that stuff, still a thing, okay? So let's say I have this function right here. Let's just actually jump into this and start uh, finding partial derivatives. Let me make this a little bigger so you guys can see. All right, so I want you to find the partial of z with respect to x, and I want you to find the partial of z with respect to y, and very glad that Abdul Rahman uh, volunteered here. Who else can I call on? Who's, the, who's usually chatty that they're, they've not been very chatty so far? That. Now, the shy people do need to get out of their shells, but you know, sometimes calling on them right away is not, it's not so nice. They need to work on their shyness first. Abdul Rahman, you there? All right, tell me what's the partial of this guy with respect to X? Here's the function, y times e to the xy plus sine of x divided by y. Natalie, start working on the partial with respect to y of that guy. No Wolfram, because <laughs> I know I can't see you guys, come on. What about the, the first part? Y e to the xy. If I differentiate that with respect to x, what do I get? And by the way, the rest of you should be doing this, even though I even though I didn't call on anyone specific, everybody should be writing down what they think is the answer. Right? It's very important more important than you realize. Like if you just watch it, even if you watch me do stuff or you watch someone else do stuff and it makes perfect sense, it does not mean that you would be able to reproduce that thing on a test. You will never know what you're able to do unless you actually do it. Okay, all right, and then what would you get? Are you there? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, geez, sorry about that. I, I was literally here waiting and I'm like, what has taken Abdul Rahman so long? And I'm thinking he's stuck and it's just my internet went out. <laughs> like, you made wow. me host again. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make anyone host. It randomly picked someone. I don't know why. It and picked... it always picks me. Well, I, 
I don't, I, I can't explain it. It knows you're the genius. I had a reason, probably. Anyway, uh, let's jump back into it. <laughs> so, um, when is, uh, what is uh, partial with respect to X? Abdul Rahman. Okay, so the Y in the front, we would ignore since it's a constant. Yeah. And so we would get the derivative of E X to the Y, but we'd make A, I mean Y equal K. Okay. Basically, so what would the derivative look like? Be Y times E to the X, Y. Right. So remember our general rule would be the derivative of, if we're, and now I'm thinking of single variable calculus, so you see how I write the D. The derivative of e to the u is what? u prime e to the u. So I just want to take the derivative of the power times the original function. Now the derivative of the power with respect to x is just y. So I would have another y. So in other words, here I have a y times y e to the xy. Right. Then um, the sine function. So um, the derivative of sine be cosine. Mm -hmm. And um, we would leave the inside as it is, and then we would um, multiply it to the derivative of the inside. Which is? Y is a constant, we would leave it on the denominator, and yeah. the derivative of x is one, so it'd be times one over y. Right, so chain rule here. So you use the chain rule for both of these. So y squared e to the xy plus one over y cosine of x over y. Right. And notice that uh, what we're using here is a chain rule. Same thing here as well. Actually, it was a product rule. Uh, we didn't need the product rule here. Uh, we're, we're good. We need it for the partial with respect to y, though. Natalie, did you finish that? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so for the first part, uh, looking at it, looking at it with respect to y, I mm -hmm. did the product rule. So I got mm -hmm. e to the x y plus uh, x to the e. Sorry, x times e to the x y times y. And then for the second part, uh, it was a chain rule. So I got uh, plus cosine x over y in the inside times negative x, y, I mean, no, times negative x over y squared. Right. So here our z was y e to the x, y plus the sine of x over y. And again, you can think of the, the inside here as x, y to the minus 1. So the derivative of that is going to be minus x, y to the minus two, which is what that, that guy is. Um, but here, what we did is we used the chain rule. And here, what we did is we used the product rule. Because here, I have two functions of y. e to the x, y is a function of y, and y is a function of y. So I have to differentiate one, leave the other, then leave the first, differentiate the other one. So I differentiate the y and you would get here the one. Then you leave the y, which is here, and then you differentiate the exponential. So that you can actually clean up. Yeah. Uh, so e to the xy plus xy e to the xy minus, minus x. x. Right. And that's your partial with respect to y. All right. Good job, people. All right. Let's uh, move That's on. what I got. Like, you know, for the, thank God I got it right for the two. Yes. Both uh, of them. I know, Jason. I know. All right. Here's another one. And at this point, I'm not teaching anything new. I just want you guys to get a lot of uh, practice. All right, Jason, partial derivative of that with respect to x. Go. All right. Let me take some time to solve it. Then I'll. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't even tell Natalie had social anxiety, so I don't know. Based on what she's saying in the chat. <laughs> 
is fine. Okay. Natalie is probably a very tough opponent to play in poker. She says she's nervous, but at the same time, her voice didn't crack, nothing. There was no indication. <laughs> like, there was no indication of anything stirring below the surface. Anyway, uh, do, the rest of you should be trying this as well. Partial derivative with respect to x of cosine divided by x plus y squared. All right, Jason, I'll give you According to what I'm seconds. assuming, I would say, like, you know, yeah. parentheses, negative sine x times parentheses, x plus y squared, subtract cosine x over parentheses, or parentheses, x plus y squared, you know, to the square power. Yeah, so we need the quotient rule. So it's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared quotient rule. That was right. Well, yeah, that's what that's that's what I had. I had an idea. This and he's he, he, he like, well, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, what you expect? You didn't expect me to get it right? <laughs> okay, so yep, that is quotient rule. Okay, good. We can move on. Now, I want you to be aware that implicit differentiation, also a thing that can be used. So sometimes we don't just have our z equals some f of x, y. Sometimes our z is kind of mixed together with everyone else. Uh, and this is in a situation, this gives us a situation where we need implicit differentiation. So here, I am thinking of my z as a function of x and y, but it's kind of mixed up with the x's and y's. Uh, we can actually go through and um, start finding derivatives here in the same way we did implicit differentiation. Now, there's going to be a really neat trick that I'm going to show you guys. And it's going to be like, when, when you see what I'm about to share, this, this, one, this example right here, this one right here, you see this right here? This one is going to be a very nice example because now you're going to realize that you could go back to calc one and you're going to be able to use this trick that I'm going to tell you. And you could have done implicit differentiation in calc one so much easier. Um, but for now, let's actually go through with our calc one brain and kind of work out this problem. So here's what it would look like. So you would go through and again, you would differentiate each term with respect to X. Now, Whenever you differentiate a term that, again, uh, think of z as an inside function. Hopefully you guys remember how implicit differentiation worked from calc one, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so, okay, quick refresher from calc one. So let's say you had x, y cubed minus y squared plus x equals seven. And you want to find, uh, find dy dx. So let's see, example from calc one. What did we do? Well, you went through and you differentiated each term. However, you just had the awareness that whenever you were differentiating a y term, you had to multiply it by the derivative. So for example, uh, you would have go through here. I'm getting a message saying my internet is unstable. Are you guys still hearing me? Someone just give me a check. Okay, all right. All right, so here uh, you go through and you differentiate. 
Um, you would, here you would think of X and Y as both functions of X. So now you have to actually do the product rule. So you differentiate the X, you would leave the Y cubed, then you would leave the X and you would differentiate the Y cubed, but because the Y was a function of X, you have to multiply by Y prime. So here you apply chain rule because y is an inside function. It's some function of x, you, but you just don't know what, right? So this means that when you see y cubed, it's really like there is some f of x cubed. And so when, and so this means that the derivative with respect to x of y cubed is going to be the derivative with respect to x of some function cubed which is going to be chain rule, differentiate the outer function, multiply by the derivative of the inner function. And so that would give you the three y squared times y prime. And that's where the y prime came from. So now you do that for the rest of them. So you go through, differentiate the x, leave the y, plus you leave the x, differentiate the y, multiply by y prime, plus, derivative of x is one, derivative of the seven is zero. Then what you're going to do is at that point, you solve for the y prime. So uh, we'd go through here. Just copying it down here so I can see. Then we'd go through here and we'd group all the guys that have y primes and factor it out. Um, so here I would have three x y squared. That takes care of this guy. Then I would have minus two x squared y. That takes care of that guy. Those were the guys with derivatives in them. We'll move everyone else to the other side. So here I'd have minus, let me open brackets. You would throw in the y cubed. That would be this guy then you'd throw in the two x y squared, that'd be this guy. Then you'd throw in the one, that'd be that guy. And then you would say y prime is equal to, well, minus, well, y cubed minus two x y squared plus one divided by three x y squared minus two x squared y, right? So that's what we'd get. So. Quick crash course in implicit differentiation from Calc 1. Uh, you guys should have been experts at Calc 1, so I'm not going to go any further into that. Um, we're going to come back to this, and I'm going to give you the red pill. But right now, let's actually continue. So I want to do that similar process here. Again, I'm just going to go through and I'm going to find the partial derivatives. So here I start by the first term, x squared y. I need to differentiate that with respect to x. Well, that's 2xy because my y is a constant. Plus, now I move to this part here, the 2xz. I think of my z as an inside function, though, because that is the dependent variable, which means there are potentially x's that are mixed inside the z. I just can't see them, which means I think of these two guys as being functions of x, and I need to do the product rule. So I would differentiate the x, leave the z, plus leave the x, differentiate the z, but now that is partial of z with respect to x. I don't use z prime because prime is too vague in the multivariable case. I'm using the Leibniz notation. Um, so now, so for this, I would need the product rule because Z is a function of X specifically and Y. All right. So now I continue like this, take the derivative of three Z squared. Well, that's going to be six Z times the partial of Z with respect to X. Then again, so here I need the chain rule. And so that's this term here. Product rule was this term here. 
Now, if I move on to the last term, x, y, z, I would need another product rule. I would then go differentiate the x, leave the y and the z, plus leave the x and the y, differentiate the z, partial of z with respect to x. Derivative of a five is zero. So again, here, I need another product rule. Now we have our derivative being taken. Now what I do is again, we play that same game. I group all the guys with the, I group all the guys with the partial with respect to Z. I would have two X, that will take care of this guy. I would have minus six Z, that will take care of this guy. I would have plus X, Y, that will take care of this guy. That's all of them. Then I would move everyone else to the other side. So the two X, Y takes care of this guy. The two Z takes care of this guy. The plus Y, Z takes care of this guy. And that's it. Now what we have is I can just divide both sides. Professor, it wouldn't be equal to plus five because where where the five go? I differentiated. Derivative of five is zero. Derivative of five is zero. Right? Like this line here that I did all the strike throughs, I'm taking derivatives. So there is no five. Okay, double checking. Can you guys hear me? I just, I'm just suspicious that I, I'm losing connection again. We can hear you. Okay, all right, good. Um, so the, the derivative of five is zero. So that's why it's not there. Now, I just uh, do this uh, divide. So this is this, this, over two X minus six Z plus X Y. Right? And that's our derivative with respect to X implicitly. Okay, now, you guys ready for this? Are you ready though? Are you guys ready? If you're not sitting down, sit down. Okay, here's what I want you to notice. You guys ready? Look at the numerator of the answer I just got. It is, <laughs> watch his internet cut out, <laughs> just as I get to the suspense, the good part. <laughs> okay, look at, look at the function. Okay, look at the numerator, just the numerator alone and the original function. And tell me what you notice. How does the numerator compare to the original equation that I gave you? It's just the partial with respect to X. What about the denominator? How does the denominator compare? Is it the partial with respect to Z? It's the partial with respect to Z. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you. I mean, some of you probably see it already, but let me look at the denominator. It is 
partial of the left side with respect to theta. Now, so here's a way we can actually express that answer. So going back to this guy, if I bring everything to the right side or the left side, and call this entire left side big F. Then here's what I want you to notice. The partial with respect to, Z, to X, partial of Z with respect to X is equal to negative, the partial of big F with respect to X divided by the partial of big F with respect to Z. In other words, if I were to take, if I were to take the partial of everybody with respect to X and divide by the partial with respect to Z, that's actually the answer that I would have gotten if I did implicit differentiation. Like I could now, use this formula, right? And you can get the answer right away without going through all of these techniques, these technical stuff where you're moving stuff again. Now, here's, here's where it's really going to, to catch you. Look at the calc one example again. What I, what I want to show you is that a form like this will work in general. And it even works in Calc 1. But they couldn't tell you about it in Calc 1 because uh, you didn't know about a partial derivative. Let me show you. Go back to the Calc 1 example. Implicit differentiation probably uh, caused you a lot of headaches back in Calc 1. Let me show you how trivial it is and could have been. So find dA dy dx if this is true. What I could do is think of this guy here as big F. Then my dy dx is just going to be the negative partial with respect to x over partial with respect to y. Go through here, take the partial with respect to x. What do you get? Well, you get y cubed minus 2xy squared plus 1. Take the partial with respect to y. What do you get? You would get 3xy squared minus 2x squared y plus, well, 0. Now look at that. And look at what we got before. It's the same guy. Like implicit differentiation didn't have to be this game where you're applying the chain rule and you're, you're collecting terms and you're moving things to the other side. You could literally use partial derivatives and a simple formula, this ratio, and find an implicit derivative with this. Now this, so if we wanted, say the partial of X with respect to Y, we could do minus f y over f x. Are you guys still there? I want to make sure I didn't like lose internet. We're here. Okay. 
So you're all like speechless, is that it? <laughs> like, literally, look at that. I could literally just look at this and write down the answer. I can look at this and write down the answer. Let, let, let's try it again. By the way, uh, this comes from a generalization of the chain rule that you'll see in the next class. Stay tuned for 213. All right, let me give you guys an example to do. See if you can apply this. All right, so uh, professor? X, yeah. Uh, the last one that we did, like, you know, why is it negative instead of positive for the numerator? The negative always comes by because we're moving things to the other side. The guys that don't have derivatives attached to them, they are moved to the other side. So it's always going to be a negative. Because for this problem, because I, when I was trying to solve it, I got... Jason, positive 2xy plus 2z plus yz over huh over what i got positive 2xy plus yes. 2z plus yz over 2x minus 6z plus xy okay you made a mistake if the if you don't have the negative here you might have a change in sign here but there definitely should be a negative if you had 2xy plus 2z plus yz on the top, you should have 6z minus 2x minus xy on the bottom. You made, a, you made an arithmetic error. But right, what's how about this negative, one? Though? I just want to know what's with the negative since it's like dz over dx. It's, it's a very, it's a, what do you mean what's with the negative? The negative comes from moving things to the other side. To get something to the other side, you just, you subtract them. Well, how are we able to move them from the other side? Like, you know, you please go up? By subtracting them from the other side. How would I move this to the other side? I would subtract it. Uh, so what do you just basically did with the five though? Why is it because of the five? I mentioned that already. The five is a constant. The derivative of five is zero. The five disappears once I start taking derivatives. Why do you have to move things around? I think it just simply... What I'm trying to say is you don't have to move things around. You can use a formula like this. That's the point of this whole thing that I'm trying to show you. You don't have to move things around. Let, let me actually uh, show you again. Uh, let's say I had this. What if I actually defined the partial of y with respect to z. So here you're thinking of y as the uh, inside function, your x and z are independent variables. You could simply go, oh, this is going to be minus big F with respect to z over the partial of big F with respect to y. The answer is going to be Go through, take the partial with respect to z. You'll get 3xyz squared. Then you would have plus 1 over z. Then you go through and take the partial with respect to y. You would have xz cubed minus 2x. That's your answer. If I, if I had asked you, find the partial with respect to z of y, what I would have done is minus partial y over partial z. Then that would just be, well, xz cubed minus 2x over 3xyz squared plus 1 over z, etc. Like implicit differentiation is really a one-liner. It's something that you don't even need to show work for, really. You should be able to do it in your head. Like that's what I wanted to actually show you guys. Like with the power of partial derivatives, we can look at something like implicit differentiation, which in Calc 1 is a whole process. But actually, nah, you can do it with a, like a simple formula that you can like just write it down in your head.
anyway, we have some more stuff to talk about with partial derivatives. It's pretty much more of the same kind of practice though. Um, and as well as I have to talk about notation, but this is going to spill into tomorrow because we're already like over time. Okay. So that's it for today. I, I didn't realize it was getting, uh, it was getting pretty late there. Uh, so I'll wrap that up. I'll leave the rest of the notes in the PDF so you guys can read through it and maybe try some stuff on your own for the, uh, tomorrow's class, which will finish up partial derivatives for sure. Um, but yeah, you can re-envision a lot of things in terms of partial derivatives. And you'll see that a lot of processes in Calc 1 that were like a whole bunch of steps you had to go through aren't really a whole bunch of steps anymore. Um, so go through, you can read the thing about notation and we will pick up with those things tomorrow. Uh, and hopefully that was fun for you guys. We will stop there. Just a reminder, our test is on Saturday. It will cover everything up to partial derivatives, including what I'm going to look at tomorrow. And we will stop there. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Have a good dinner. Have a good night. And I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.